thank you everyone and welcome to this very special episode of the Chasing Consciousness podcast here at Live at Medicine Festival 2021. And this has been all been programmed by Ruby Reed. So a big thanks to Ruby Reed for the talks uh, program of this weekend. And today's talk is called Psychedelics in a Changing World, Medicalization, Planetary Healing and Reciprocity. And for that, we have a panel with an absurd amount of experience, which I won't be able to introduce properly here. So thanks to our panelists for accepting a very brief introduction. So we have Dr. Ben Sessa. We have great Gabriel Amesqua. We have Andrea Longlois. We have Nick von Christiansen. We have Ashley Murphy Biner, who's now taken her, her chair in Pete's place, and David Luke. So, short introductions, guys. Dr. Ben Sessa, a medical doctor, a psychiatrist, a licensed psilocybin and MDMA psychotherapist, and a published psychedelic researcher and author. Gabriel Amesqua, a medical anthropologist, innovating in mental health, harm reduction, and drug policy with strong ties to organizations in Latin America. Ashley Murphy Biner at the end, a trainee clinical psychologist at Imperial College's highly respected Center for Psychedelic Research, and has recently published her first scientific paper on the effects of ayahuasca. Nick Van Christiansen is the CEO of Woven Science, which specializes in holistic psychedelic models of care whilst engaging in reciprocity towards indigenous communities. <coughs> Andrea Langlois is a psychotherapist and director of engagement at, uh, for internet, not a psychotherapist, <laughs> <laughs> but she is the director of engagement for International Center of Ethno -Botan uh, Botanical Education, Research and Service. And she specializes, I hope, in the intersection between shamanism and psychedelics. Is that close, Andre? She can introduce herself better in a moment. And last but not least, the infamous David Luke, a psychology professor, psychedelic research, and a specialist in exceptional human experience, the title of his, the title of his new book. I'm just Freddie Drabel. I am uh, an actor and the <coughs> host of the Chasing Consciousness podcast. So we're just going to go straight into it, guys, because we've got so much to get through today. We're going to start talking about medicalization. So this a little bit more to Ben, Ashley and David, working more on the medical side. However, there will be a chance for everyone else to, to talk afterwards. So you've all been involved quite heavily in the testing and prescription of psychedelics as an alternative to conventional psychopharmaceuticals. How does it feel that this idea is really getting traction now with the medical establishment? Is it purely a success story? Or are there some shadows lurking that we need to be aware of to be sure that we don't get derailed as this fantastic work becomes upscaled throughout the medical establishment? Let's try and get the pros and cons. Ben, do you want to start about five minutes? Yeah, thank you very much. Uh, firstly, thank you very much, everybody, for coming. Thank you very much for an invitation. This is a lovely, lovely festival. I am loving it so far. Um, I love this word, med medicalization. I often get asked at conferences, Ben, do you worry about the over-medicalization of psychedelics? And I say, I worry about the under-medicalization of psychedelics. <laughs> Psychedelic medicines work. They are fast, they are effective, they are safe, they have high levels of efficacy, they are superior to our current top-down biological medical model that we use in psychiatry that has failed patients for a hundred years of modern psychiatry. There is now a new, creative, dynamic, psychopharmacological option in combination with psychotherapy which works and it will break the stuck, rigid narratives of our worthy patients who have been failed by a hundred years of modern psychiatry. SSRIs, daily maintenance medications, antipsychotics, neuroleptics, hypnotics, these are maintenance, papering over the crack drugs. These are drugs you take every day, week in, week out, weeks, months, years, decades, to hold back the tide of symptoms but not cure the patient. That, that C word, cure, is a word we've lost in psychiatry. We've become learned helpless, we have become palliative care doctors. We don't cure our patients, we get alongside them for life. If you're going to your psychiatrist in your early 20s with a severe mental disorder, anxiety-based disorder, depression, PTSD, addictions, eating disorders, it doesn't really matter what the end phenotype med um, diagnosis is because they're all 
ridiculous categories. The chances are you will still be going to see that psychiatrist in your 60s and 70s. This is not good enough after 100 years of modern psychiatry. Psychedelics represent the most definitive, um, uh, the most original and creative and effective option for our patients going forward. Now, medicalization to me means accessibility, means increasing this. After 75 years of LSD, only 2% of the population on the world has taken LSD. That's a terrible outcome. But that is, I mean, that's, that is a huge PR failure on the part of psychedelics. 2% of the world has used this drug, and, and the 2% that have tell, tell you that it's the most profound and important experience of their life. That's a terrible bit of advertising and PR for a very important molecule. So, yes, medicalization. Yes, make this mainstream. And that requires structure, it requires corporations, unfortunately. It requires working with governments, not against governments. It requires infrastructure, it requires banks, it requires money. It's very expensive to deliver public health care on a large scale. It can't be done on the back of an envelope. It requires all of those boring machinations of the man, uh, which we all don't like to think about. But unfortunately, that is the reality, because my worthy patients deserve these worthy medicines. And I cannot sit there and see another 50 years of prohibition. We need to get this right now. We have a second bite of the cherry after the failure at the end of the 60s. This is our opportunity. Now is the time of not just a psychedelic renaissance, this is a psychiatric renaissance. This is a new way of doing mental health. We need to do it, and we need to do it by working with, not against authorities. So I think that's where my position would be. Strong work, ben. Ben, just just before we move over to Ashley, what about the shadow? Because with all great things, all movements in any direction, there's always a little shadow. Do you have any concerns? It sounds like you're, you're, you're going for positivity first. Huh. What do we need to be careful of? I go with positivity first because I find that's much more easier for me to sit in. Mm. Um, mm. Yeah, no, absolutely. I absolutely understand the concerns of the <coughs> mistakes that have been made in the past with the industrialization of the pharmaceutical industry. And we can learn lessons from that. And if you look at psychedelic protocols, um, in formal settings, in clinical settings. We have used a lot of the work of indigenous cultures, of non-Western uses of psychedelics, the whole concept of set and setting, and the way in which they're delivered. Um, we, we're not shedding that. It's not an either or, it's a both and situation. We need to wor work with all of those hundreds, thousands of years of underground psychotherapy use of psychedelics. Um, I can understand completely the fears of people who see medicalization as corporatization. Um, and what I hope is to reassure people that there is a way of doing this that can be done in a small cottage industry type approach that involves people and brings the public in. The most important thing is we get this over the line and we have this as massive accessibility for public health care. Ben, massive. Obviously, Big Pharma might come in there. Do we do we let them in? Do we do we monitor them carefully? What's what's the solution to watching out for the, for the big guys? We create our own pharma industry. There is indeed, in fact, a, a small startup called Small Pharma, which is specialising in, in DMT at the moment. Um, the, in, the 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 company that I've set up is essentially a pharmaceutical company, mm. but it's what it's half a dozen hippies mm. who are trying to bring MDMA and ketamine and psilocybin into mass public use. So mm. call me a you know am I do I look like someone from the pharma industry? Mm. It's the pharma industry doesn't have to be something that we're scared of. These are just words for delivery of medicines to people. Mm. It can be done in a beautiful way, in a non-profit way. It can be done in a way that's effective, that involves people. We shouldn't be scared of the words. We need to understand what we mean by those structures. Absolutely. So there are dark, dark sides, but we don't need to repeat them. Yeah, and we'll be speaking with Nick from New Urban shortly. Ashley, passing over to you. You've worked a lot uh, at Imperial College. Tell us what's your take on this process of medicalization. Thank you. Um, what a delight to be with you all here. And um, yeah, great to hear you, Ben. Great to hear you kind of uh, laying the kind of foundations of where we are and, and what everything's like right now. Um, so I, I love shadows. I uh, <laughs> love getting down in the weeds and, and, and looking at all those, um, the other side of the coin, you know, I think light and dark, it's two sides of the same coin. And actually, there's a, a great deal to be learned and, and a great deal of value in that. Um, exploration of the other side and I think if if anything when we you know 
I'm, I, I may guess that some of you have had psychedelic experiences. Uh, <laughs> they've got that balance too. Um, so I think that where we are, I actually agree with Ben in the sense that um, the mainstreaming is happening and globally there are 264 million people who are suffering with depression. Um, in the UK, I think it's 20% of people every year will experience anxiety or depression. This is real and people are really suffering and it's hard. You know, our treatments are not really working well enough right now. Too many people suffer for too long. Um, so I really agree that we need to work with, we need to go with the flow of where this is going, but I think we need to do that in a certain kind of way. So I think it's about how we do it and who we are as we do it. Um, and I think this movement has been built on a lot of very strong values, which we can actually carry through with us as we do that. Um, some of the, uh, I suppose I should name some of the, those shadow sides that I think might be there at the moment. Um, so I think if we take the current context right now, um, the media has really propelled these uh, substances and the, these kind of psychedelic therapy treatments right into the mainstream. And so now people who actually have no prior experience, no knowledge of psychedelics, they are now seeking these treatments in the underground and at, um, uh, overseas retreat centers or taking them on their own at home. And lots of them are having positive experiences, but what we're seeing in um, kind of supporting people through those experiences is that sometimes they're not having positive experiences and they're, and they're maybe just as likely to find unsafe and unethical kind of spaces, settings, practitioners as they are safe and ethical ones. And I think that's put quite a lot of pressure on therapists right now because as therapists, we have an ethical duty to prevent harm wherever we can. So we've really kind of, as a community of therapists, kind of tried to step in, I think, here and, and provide some harm reduction and integration support and, and really help. But therapists are doing that without any um, guidance yeah, without any guidance on the legal and the ethical complexities of that work. Um, and, and the work needs to happen. It really does. And it's, it's, it's important. And the people doing it, I think, really, really care about it. But I think we need some support structures for the therapists who are doing that work right now. I think also the, the other kind of support structures that we need um, relate to the fact that the psychedelic experience is actually not the psychedelic experience, uh, per se, but psychedelic therapy treatments are actually quite different to ordinary therapy. So in lots of ways, they're really similar, but I'm sure, yeah, my colleagues might agree that in some ways they're really different, particularly for kind of holding space. Um, you know, things like therapeutic touch and ideas about helping people move through emotional resistance. Those are quite delicate and sensitive topics and they're quite the work is very delicate and the work is very sensitive and people who are having these treatments or anybody kind of in a psychedelic uh, altered state of consciousness is really vulnerable you know particularly in a kind of therapeutic setting because they might be reliving trauma they might um you know they might be regressing to a kind of childlike state of self they might be experiencing absolute terror or panic or confusion and those things might be incredibly helpful beneficial and great but they're also kind of make the person quite vulnerable and even at the other end of the spectrum if people are having really positive experiences you know they might feel like um some kind of sexual arousal and again that kind of opens the door for the need to really think about the ethics of that setting and how we hold that container and what support structures therapists really need to to be able to do very very deep self-reflection and and to be held really holding themselves really accountable in that work to make sure that people are really safe and and the work is done really ethically um, and, I, and, and the other thing that I think is, you know, beyond that, we're actually thinking about not just the kind of ethics and, and, and the, the shadow sides of the, the treatment itself and what therapists might need, but also the bigger picture, because we need to think about where we want to position uh, psychedelic therapy within mainstream therapy. Am I okay for time? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> So we need to think about, you know, as we're kind of bringing these into to sit alongside mainstream approaches that actually, you know, I'd really like them to be there, but to also be different. So not to just replicate what we already have. And I think there's a real risk of that if we over prioritize um, 
the biological correlates of the experience. And if we focus very narrowly on these being psychiatric medicines that treat mental illness, which is located inside the body or the brain, and I think then we really start to leave out all of the other things that we know about mental health, that it's got social determinants, that it's got cultural determinants. You know, we know that... Um, in the UK, African and Caribbean people, for example, have a higher risk of uh, developing PTSD and of suicide. We know that the poorest 20% of children are, are, I think it's four times more likely to have um, a mental health difficulty by the age of 11 compared to the wealthiest 20%. And I think we really need to be thinking about the kinds of theoretical models that we're building with psychedelic mental health care approaches to make sure that we're developing them ethically in that bigger, wider sense as well. And really holding to that you know, promise and opportunity for these treatments to be something else and to, to hold the whole person and to really um, hold the environment and the social and the cultural factors too, so that we, you know, we're doing something different. Thank you, Ashley. <laughs> Yeah, so much coming out here, which we're definitely going to be coming back to, aren't we? Um, Sooner than you David. think. David. Yeah. Because <laughs> actually, actually, it's um, <clears throat> basically said everything I was going to say. So. <laughs> I'm just going to nip off. A friend of mine's giving a talk about <laughs> Kundalini and the other ten. Uh, anyway, thank you. I'm delighted to be here, and thanks for the invitation, and to be amongst friends old and new, and such a wonderful audience. Uh, so yeah, I was going to pick up on well, actually bits that Ashley said, but also what Ben was saying as well about. Yes, the psychedelics work. We, they do work, but how do they work? And in the biomedical model, they work on a, by biological means, right? They, and there's this kind of desperate search. It's somewhat desperate, as is probably beleaguered kind of psychiatry throughout its entire history, to find kind of organic causes to psychosocial problems, essentially, uh, mental, mental health conditions. And, you know, we've seen that already with the shifting sands around psychedelics. First of all, it was hyperfrontality, then it was default mode network activity. Now it's, uh, it's kind of plasticity in the brain as the kind of underlying kind of explanations for why psychedelics work. And they keep moving the goalposts already in the space of 10 years. And now we see that the FDA in the States, who are on the threshold of approving psychedelics as medicaments, which would be great because it would be good for access to people, is that... Thank you. Uh, the, the FDA are now saying that they want to see that psychedelics work even when people don't have an experience. Uh, so that they want to see people being anesthetized throughout their psychedelic experience and then see if it still has any kind of effect before they'll, they'll consider licensing it. And we have this rush uh, amongst pharmaceutical companies to develop non-psychedelic psychedelics. So these are take psychedelics, give them a little chemical tweak so that they have no subjective experience, but still supposedly, hopefully, we don't know, have this kind of uh, medical benefit. As somebody pointed out, it's a bit like having uh, sex without an orgasm. But, you know, if you've gone to the Kundalini talk, you know, sex without an orgasm isn't that bad. So it's probably like... <laughs> It's probably more like sex without sex, you know. It's like, it, is it going to work? And this is like the, you know, the million dollar question. It's actually worth much more than that, this kind of question currently. It's worth billions of dollars because, you know, the whole psychedelic bubble of, of excitement and delirium and joy we've created around these things, developing as new med medicines could well pop if actually they discover that psychedelics don't need to be psychedelic to work. I, I personally don't think that's going to happen because a lot of the research coming through in the States particularly is saying, like, you know, the mystical experience seems to be something that's really key and important in people's, you know, efficacy and well-being in the clinical trials. If you have a mystical experience, you're much more likely to get over your depression or anxiety or addictions, particularly addictions or whatever it may be, induced by a psychedelic. So we think the subjective experience, you know, our mere part in in the whole process is in some way important and i think so like there's a danger of over medicalization that the medical model for all its its brilliance is is kind of maybe missing a bit of a trick and we've moved forward into this kind of <coughs> bio -psycho, psychosocial model within psychiatry but perhaps you also need to have a bio psychosocial spiritual model you know maybe kind of adopt a little bit more from from shamanic traditional uses of psychedelics which has been around for thousands of years but doesn't really easily fit into a medical model very well for instance you know you go to 
to your doctor or psychiatrist and you say, oh, doc, this is up with me. And they poke you around, they ask you some questions and then they prescribe you some drugs. If you go to an indigenous shaman, they look at you, they take the medicine and then they tell you what's wrong with you. I mean, that, that's a completely different worldview altogether. You know? So how do we kind of bridge the gap? Uh, and I think that those kind of questions need uh, really exploring. But I think what is key is is the notion of, of community, uh, you know, and that's a very different way of, of doing it, you know, in, in, in kind of psychedelic modalities within indigenous cultures. It, it's done in, in group environments often, not always, but often. And I think that's, you know, a key part moving forward in the medical model really probably needs to start incorporating more of these kind of community dimensions because... Yes, psychedelics work, but how do they work? And I don't think it's purely biological. And I think, you know, community is really important in all of that. So mm. I'll leave it there. Thank you, David, for the starters. Woo! And we're, we're definitely going to be coming back to shamanism and to community uh, in the later part of the talk. Just quickly, Nick, I know you have one of these organisations. Is there anything, Andre and Nick... Um, Gabriel, that you'd like to add just a little 30 seconds in response to, to the doctors? <laughs> yeah, yeah, thanks, thanks, um, Freddie. Yeah, I think well, woven science is, you know, the, the, the crux of what we're trying to achieve here is actually to create that bridge and figure out what is the Western cultural container to administer these extremely powerful compounds. Um, and uh, we have a long, long way to go. <laughs> Um, Do you want to I, mention quickly what your yeah, organization Yeah, so we, Women's does? Science, so we, we back, build, and, and incubate um, companies that address uh, one or more verticals of the treatment arc. And, and how we define the treatment arc is from diagnosis, preparation, the, the peak experience itself, and then arguably the most important verticals of, of integration and community were probably the least understood. So what we're trying to do is, is really try and figure out what is the Western cultural container, as I said, to, to administer these compounds. and. Mm. At Woven's part of our philosophy is that we have to look to original knowledge and wisdom in order to bridge that, that world who, who have that existing infrastructure. If you look at indigenous people, they have a shaman, they have an elder, they have a community, they have a, a place to integrate. They have that, that human connection, which is what this is, this is what's driving a lot of the, 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 the mental illness pandemic that we find ourselves in is the fact that there's a lot of the humans are lacking that connection. So I think mm. for us, it's, it's really trying to figure out um, how we do this in a collaborative manner and, and woven science is essentially building an ecosystem and, and you know using principles of biomimicry where um, those uh, the most prosperous ecosystems are the ones that are most diverse and interconnected and and we're we're not claiming we have the answers but at the same time we're trying to align ourselves with individuals and companies who who share similar values and a vision to, to redefine mental health care and, and lest we forget that this is this is arguably the most important industry humanity will ever build and nick before we move on to reciprocity where you guys are going to get your your full five minutes uh is there anything you want to add about medicalization in the context of what ben david and ashley have said yeah i think listen it's you know psychedelics the psychic renaissance is arguably the biggest threat to big pharma big pharma repeat business is good business exhibit a uh, SSRIs, Oxycontin, the opioid crisis. Um, and they're going to own this industry. They're going to try their best to own it. And so when we talk about medicalization, we talk about accessibility, you know, what does that actually mean? Because, you know, they've got to make up for their losses of people not being addicted to their, their, their products. So, you know, you've got the juggernauts of US healthcare going head to head where insurance companies repeat business as bad biz business. So, yes, reimbursement will kick in at some points. But... But I think you know, we, we have to realize that there is no magic pill here. You know, we talk about <coughs> medicalization, we're talking about the existing infrastructure that we currently have, mm. which is treating the symptoms. And we want to fo shift the focus from you know, treating ailments to actually sustaining mental wellness. And what does that look like? It, look, it could look like a, you know, a, a wellness sanctuary, Church 2.0, a, a center for transformation and connection that yes, has psycholic assisted therapy, but it also has, you know, a shop where you can buy your probiotics, your supplements. It has a, a breathwork class. It has a yoga class. So we need to figure out a way which indigenous people have been using for thousands of years to incorporate that into a Western setting. And it goes beyond just the medicalization path. Sounds almost, sounds almost like a demedicalization, really, is the long-term aim. Yeah. Andrea, anything to add? <laughs> can I, sorry, can I just ask the, the speakers to speak a bit closer to the mic so we can hear? Thank you, Pete. Where to start? <laughs> yeah, just thirty seconds this time, Andre. We were about to go to a yeah. I just think that thinking about this in an ecosystem approach and thinking that I think 
so I work for an organization that's really looking to bridge mm. science, indigenous knowledge, other things. And so while medicalization, I think, is of critical importance to really move things forward to help people within a certain model and has needed science. And, you know, I live in, I'm from Canada. Hopefully the insurance, you know, our, our national insurance will pay for it. Yeah, what I worry about is all of the other ways of using these medicines, that if we focus only on medicalization, where do um, other ceremonial uses come into play? Are we supporting indigenous people to travel with their medicines? Are we looking at what Bob Jesse calls better than well? Do we need to be diagnosed to access? And so I think, you know, figuring out how to keep the door more widely open from a policy context and then also into integrating into Western cultures of how do we use these medicines in multiple different ways that there's not just one access point is something that I would just bring attention to. Massive. Gabriel, anything to add? Yes. Well, first of all, all the... Um I'm sorry for my English. It's not my native language, and I'm learning German at this moment, so my words are going to be like... <laughs> Okay, so uh, I think the metaphor is really beautiful because the same as, you know, as above, as below. And when we take psychedelics, when we take a psychedelic, uh, we need to question our structures. It's not a magic pill, as they say. So we're going to realize that many things that we have inside ourselves, we, they need to be taken care of. Uh, we need to pay attention to things that are underlying. And I think humanity is taking a psychedelic and we need to take care of a lot of things. I'm, I'm an optimistic as, as Ben. I think it's going to be beautiful. I think many beautiful things are going to happen with the medical system and with the s approach to psychology and psychiatry. But we need to pay attention, as Andrea says, to how we do it in terms of accessibility, decolonization. Uh, we need to understand how to bring the indigenous people, the communities, to this process, to make them part of the process. Because if we just keep isolating them in a process of like, oh, yeah, yeah, you, you do your thing, I do mine, and we exclude them from the medicalization process, then medicalization is just not going to advance. It's going to stand where it is. Then diagnosis. Are we going to keep diagnosing people, as you say? like, Because diagnosis is not actually very thorough in terms of how psychedelics work. I mean, psychedelics are a lot about well-being, not only about depression or about anxiety, are about also like improving our quality of life. And then we have uh, who's going to administer the substances. In medicalization, uh, for now, the perspective, FDA put the, the process, I work with MAPS, and one of the conditions was like, okay, only doctors and PhD psychologists can administer MDMA. And many friends that I have, like working in the, in the San Francisco University, like we're being uh, providers of psychedelics, they say, like, I've seen that the best providers are actually nurses, chaplains, uh, people who know the community, people who know how to approach people, not necessarily a psychiatrist. I mean, I'm sure that many psychiatrists are <laughs> really good at it. But, but we need to include more people. And how are we going to develop that process? We need to question medicalization. And we need to understand that in questioning, we're not diminishing it. We're just questioning the structure so that it can evolve with the process of psychedelic medicine. Brilliant, Gabriel. That's, that brings us beautifully on to uh, the second theme today of reciprocity. Now, I, I think this is quite a complex term, so I'm going to hand it over to Andrea for her five-minute presentation and just maybe we should look at the ideas behind it rather than the word itself. It's going to be uh, interesting to get everyone's point of view on this. First of all, Andrea. Thank you. Tell us well, so roughly what is reciprocity? Well, the word, the concept of reciprocity actually comes from indigenous traditions. So I just want to situate that. And so I think we need to be really careful when we then take it and impose it over what we're doing within the psychedelic community. Personally, I feel like I can only speak for myself, but also looking at society right now, that reciprocity is the, the key imbalance that needs to be corrected. If we look at depression, it's about disconnection, climate change disconnection, and that you know all of these ailments of modern society that really are asking us each as individuals and as a collective to come back into reciprocity in our relationship with Gaia. 
And so if we look to indigenous cultures who have been working with these medicines for generations, if we look um, you know, to the um, Wairarika with peyote, um, the Buiti and, uh, communities in Gabon with iboga, the ayahuasca communities basically have managed somehow over, over 500 years of colonization to adapt and stay connected to a connection with earth. Um, not all, but there are some, some strong wisdom traditions that somehow through the use of these medicines have managed to continue to keep their cultures and their practices alive. I think that's a big teaching to look to, not so that we can go and take those knowledges and make them ours. So if we look at where we're going with plant medicines and psychedelics, I think there's a huge danger if we then disconnect it from this source and we take... Then we're ba and then we put into a system, we basically created another disconnection and we're hoping that it's going to be good medicine. And I would question that. And so I think um, what we've seen in the last couple of years is this beautiful concept of reciprocity be really taken up within the psychedelics community. And I, th I think there's really good intention behind it, but I have really big concerns about a type of greenwashing. I'm going to um, be, you know, make a ton of money off, off of um, making psilocybin into a, into a pharmaceutical, and then I'm going to you know, donate some money over here, and I've done my reciprocity. And so contextualizing this word, I think we need to look at that for our own practices, our own selves, what we're learning from the medicine, put that into practice in all parts of our lives. And when we look at the psychedelic community, I think we need to be looking at reparations. Where are the reparations from the Mazatec community whose medicine was basically taken and now we're benefiting from? Benefit sharing. How do we look to models of benefit sharing, of sharing benefits back? And so some people are calling that reciprocity, but I think we need to get a lot more specific and say, how do we bring benefits back to communities and involve in that process? And what does solidarity look like when the Amazon is burning, when there's an oil spill, when, when communities are struggling from natural disaster that we're all a part of? How do we, as, as members of a psychedelic community, act in solidarity because that's what we want to be doing? And then look at reciprocity as a much bigger piece. So my invitation, I think, is really within the psychedelics community to be really specific about what, what it is that we're engaged with and taking this reciprocity concept and, and bringing it back to its more original notion, which is about being in balance with all. As soon as it becomes between me and you, it becomes trans transactional and it's not really reciprocity any longer. Mm. Um, and then just to <coughs> tip the hat, I work really closely with a group called Umiak in Colombia and my friend there, Ricardo, I've talked to him about some of these ideas, and, and he said, if you, you can't jump to reciprocity before you deal with dialogue and engaging in some of these processes with indigenous communities first. And so it's just an invitation to really start teasing this apart and looking at the processes we can each be involved in to, to move that forward. Mm. So thank you. Thank you. Gabriel, yeah, thank you. I'm sure. <laughs> so Gabriel, Tell us, give us, give us five minutes. What does reciprocity mean for you? Because it's been interpreted in so many ways, mm -hmm. and particularly even in this tight context of psychedelics, there's so much to say about it. Um, wow. I mean, I think first of all, it's important to say that I don't know, and the reason why I don't know it's because uh, it changes with each situation. That's exactly what recipro reciprocity means. Uh, in, in Spanish, reciprocity, uh, it said, dar de vuelta, which uh, translation is to give back. So reciprocity is to give back, but what were you given? So if you're going to give back something, it's, it's something that you received. So you were given something and you're going to give back that. Mm -hmm. So in reciprocity means precisely that what you're going to give depends on what you received. So it's something that needs to be studied according to the situation. <laughs> because each situation is different. You're going to go to the Amazon and you're going to take the knowledge of a uh, Shipibo or, to the, or from the Cofanes from Colombia or from the Maracames of Mexico. <laughs> what were you given? Were you given friendship, wins wisdom? <laughs> so reciprocity means, I think, from my perspective, I, I studied um, perspective of soci sociology that is called grounded theory. That means that if you want to understand something really deeply, you need to actually ground yourself into the process and stay there for a while. You don't understand a phenomenon 
until you are two years studying the phenomenon and being there and becoming part of the phenomenon. Mm -hmm. So reciprocity mm -hmm. is participation, is engagement, is respect to the process. They don't want our money. They don't want us to bring them to conferences in Europe and be like, yay, thank you, Marakami. <laughs> or giving them spaces for, to, to show their feathers. They, they want to be part. They want to be respected. Uh, yesterday we were listening to these African musicians in the, in the movement tent. And one of them said, um, I know English. Who knows Ugandan? <laughs> That is reciprocity. Who knows uh, how many tribes are in, in the Amazon? Who knows the, their differences? <laughs> Who knows what they believe and how they fight between them? Their competences, their knowledges. <laughs> we don't really know. We generalize them. We put them in the box of indigenous populations. And it's like, oh yeah, we're helping indigenous pop. What's indigenous populations? They feel bad when you call them indigenous populations. They're like, I'm not indigenous, I'm Shipibo, I'm Kofan, I'm Burokua, I'm whatever. That's what they are. They are communities of people. So reciprocity is being there and listening to them and participating. I remember that when I was studying with um, my Cambo practitioner, he was telling me that Dar de Vuelta was becoming friends. And for him, the concept was like, Dar de vuelta is like that, I want you to be my friend and I want you to care for my family and that if I need to travel to Germany to give Cambo, that you stay here taking care of my kids and of my dog and of my family, that's reciprocity for me. Because I, what we need is, is just be part of the community. I was also talking with Bia Labate from Chacruna Institute. She's also very engaged with the Brazilian communities and she at some point told me like, do you think that they really want to be uh, preserved, <laughs> you know, because we have this thing about preservation. No, don't touch them. Don't bring them that. Did you ask them? <laughs> Did you actually ask them that they wanted that? Because some of them, I mean, as, as Andrea was saying, the Mazatec people in, the, in, the, in Mexico, I remember I was having a conversation with them about, uh, about mushrooms and about colonization and decolonization, and I was telling them, like, so do you feel uh, that... How do you feel that we are now in the process of mushrooms, like colonizing your knowledge? And he was laughing his ass off. And he was like, our knowledge was colonized 500 years ago. We don't even remember. What we need right now is inclusion. We want computers. We want our medical Mazatec people to go to study to Stanford and come back with this knowledge as, as respectful people from the society representing both sides. Mm. And we want the people from Stanford to come study our medicine and understand how it works. That is reciprocity. Yeah, so reciprocity is a, is a system of belief, respect, engagement, commitment, understanding, and overall friendship, love. We need to be there with people. That is reciprocity. Mm. <laughs> Wow. So bringing that back to Nick, your job, Nick, is to now <laughs> discuss reciprocity from the point of view of New Woven and bring it back to medicalization. Let's come full circle. Yeah, I'll try my best. Well, first, thank you for your beautiful words. Um, that was wonderful. Um, yeah, I mean, we, um, as I said, you know, woven science is very much a, an ecosystem. You know, it's, it's a meta organism that can harness the, the collective intelligence of all its stakeholders. And arguably the most important stakeholder when it comes to the cyclic renaissance, in our opinion, is uh, original people um, and, and trying to create that bridge between that original knowledge and wisdom and be able to impart that onto the cyclic renaissance. But rather than the, the existing structures that be in the old colonial mindset of being able to just literally tick that box by donating some money to a certain cause, what does it actually mean for them to have a real seat at the table? Um, and so we've... We've been thinking long and hard of this, long and hard about this for about two years now, and um, and we've set up an entity. I think we were the first company in in, in Cycle Lakes to actually s set up a, 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 an organisation that actually has direct equity ownership in woven science. So ten percent of our equity is owned by El Puente, which is a, a non-profit um, that essentially um, has four uh, main goals, which are 
to focus on biocultural preservation, to focus on um, appellation of origin, um, to focus on regulatory sandboxes for indigenous people to actually empower them in, in terms of you know what, what exactly what they're um, working on uh, culturally, and then um, financial sharing as well. So, as Andrea very um, art, yeah, said it very well and said that you know actually we've got to focus on reparations before we actually focus on reciprocity. And and uh, with the direct equity ownership model, we actually um, are now supporting three. Um, non-profits uh, that include the Makena Academy, um, Le Ciel Foundation, who very much have a global scope of indi supporting indigenous people, not just focus on the Amazon and, and, and plant medicines. Um, uh, and the third is the Fountain, set up by Jyoti Ma, which is uh, uh, an organization focused on preserving sacred indigenous sites around the world and actually reactivating them through ceremony. Um, and what the conversations that we've been having, and, and you know, we've interviewed pretty much, you know, most people in the space who, who are supporting indigenous people in some form. Um, we're working very closely with Andrea as well and, and Ben Christie, but is to try and figure out, um, as you said, what does it actually mean to be involved in the cyclic renaissance? And, and we've believed that that is actually A, owning a part of it and B, actually making some of the decisions of it. So we set up a, a council of elders um, at Woven Science across the five medicine lines. And um, we've we found three of the five elders I've actually um, the, the Iboga elder Etan Sal, uh, I'm actually going to be invited to, to Gabon in um, three weeks' time to get initiated by the Buiti. Um, so in terms of reciprocity, I'm actually having to step up to the plate and, and, um, and be part of um, that, that lineage and that, that original knowledge and wisdom that, that needs to be imparted onto the cyclic renaissance. So I think for us, it's really having a dialogue with all stakeholders and actually um, giving indigenous people an ability to make their decisions for themselves. Um, and as you rightly said, it's not just about um, a one-way system, this old colonial mindset of being able to you know, greenwash or, or tie-dye, as we call it, in the psychedelic space. <laughs> it's, actually, um, it's actually going a step further and, and saying, all right, fine, listen, we're, we're in this together. We need your knowledge and wisdom in order to, as I said, create the Western cultural container to administer these, these compounds. Um, and uh, and yet, yeah, woven science, we, we, know, we don't claim we have the answers, but at the end of the day, we, we know one of our core principles is stronger together, and, and we invite dialogues to, to to manifest, and and for us to kind of figure this out as to what it actually means to to build the most important industry that humanity is ever going to build with the people who who actually arguably know the most about it. putting the chat into action, just what we need, isn't it? So, responses. David, anything to add oh. on, on the reciprocity <laughs> thing? Uh, sorry, yeah, I'll I was, I was first just kind of bathing in reciprocity. It was oh. wonderful. Uh, I don't know, I was you know, in a kind of a bit of a dreamy state. Not really. Other than, uh, one thing you said is about giving Indigenous people the, the right to engage in these discussions. It's kind of like... And this brings up the whole notion of gifts as well. And is that our gift to give? Is it, yeah. uh, you know, but the, the idea of gifts that... Uh, Robert Wall Kimmerer speaks a lot about the notion of gifting, and I think that's really important. Um, but, you know, to, to give them the right to, to sit at the table is like, well, they already have that right, you know. It's kind of not ours really to give anyway. It's like with something that they, they should already be at the table in these discussions, right? Um, so I think we just like, just I, mean, I think we're constantly rethinking and reframing how how we engage with all these issues, and uh, I'm still constantly, obviously, learning. I've just learned a load from Gabrielle right now. That was brilliant. Mm -hmm. um, so just just I guess constantly update how we think, and and just to kind of bear all of these discussions in mind and and keep moving forward with it. But I think the participatory part is is really really key. I think that's I think that's massive, and I I try and span the worlds and. And you know, engaging in, in uh, you know, spending time with, particularly with Eradica, and just trying to help that to inform where I am as an academic, as a psychedelic researcher, which a lot of my colleagues don't necessarily do. You know, they're they're involved in the kind of biomedical science or the neuroscience, and that's that's where their boundaries lie, right? They don't they don't often step beyond that and go and spend time in a in a medicine ceremony or something like that. So I think it is about breaking down the boundaries and and just having this greater participation. So I've just really echoed what everyone else has said, but not quite as good a way. <laughs> <laughs> Ashley. <laughs> Thank you.
Ashley, obviously, uh, you and Rosalind over at Imperial are, are very quick to acknowledge the roots of many of your therapy models. Anything to add mm. to what they've just mentioned? I'd love to add. Um, I actually, just listening to you, Andrew and Gabriel, I feel um, very moved. I feel my heart really opened. Um, and it, 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 what I was talking about, that sensitivity of the work, that delicate nature of the work... I think that's what you've brought to life here and that it goes much beyond uh, a therapist and a patient in a room in the West that actually we are deeply interconnected and that these, um, you know, that there's a big connection in the work that we're doing here and the work that has been done um, by all of these different communities that we're talking about. And from my perspective, I guess I have a little bit of a foot in both worlds. Um, I'm on clinical trials at Imperial, um, but I've also studied ayahuasca in the Amazon. And, you know, I bring to mind um, the medicine man that I worked with. And, you know, he's a whole person. He's got flaws and great points and, you know, uh, children and a community that he's trying to care for and a nature project that he's trying to do. And, you know, all kinds of things going on in his life like other people and and i think this is what we need to remember that we we're, we're just all people and we're all trying to do this work and actually there is so much that we can learn from each other over here for our models i mean essentially i guess we're sort of culturally adapting a therapy and and we do that already in the west we culturally adapt um cbt or you know, other models as we're working with people who are from different communities living in the UK, um, that's normal. And we're kind of doing that maybe the other way a little bit. <laughs> and, and actually, we probably really need to know how these uh, models really work and, and, and how people are working with them. Um, and also, I think that the, the reciprocal nature of that relationship is that we also share the knowledge that we're developing back and that actually um, a lot of people from the West are going over to um, indigenous communities to drink ayahuasca and things like that. And actually there might be a really helpful exchange of information there for each other. Um, and so just a, a shameless plug for that. <laughs> we are trying to create an organization. We've just launched an organization called the Association for Psychedelic Therapies. Um, I'm calling it a lighthouse to try and shine a kind of light on all of these issues and, and help move this all forward in all of the kind of ethical issues that I was talking about with therapists, but also these wider kind of ethical issues. So, yeah, thank Thanks, you so Ashley. much. And uh, obviously, do come and see Ashley at the end if you're interested in that in that organisation or any of the organisations that are these, these wonderful panellists are representing today. Um, so, Ben, um, reciprocity... Yeah, Anything thank to you. add? Yeah, reciprocity. Reciprocity. I mean, for me, the word means connection and togetherness and accessibility and two-way flow of learning and development. And as a child and adolescent psychiatrist, this brings me back to the reciprocal relationship of the attachment between a pre-verbal child and a primary caregiver and how this is the most beautiful example of reciprocity a two-way modelling dance in which the caregiver makes a gesture and the pre-verbal child models the gesture. And they grow, and connectivities grow, and networks grow, and brains grow. And if you are lucky enough to be in a positive, stable, secure relationship with your, chair, with your caregiver, and you are played with, and you are praised, and you're told you're beautiful, and you're told you're clever, and you're told you're lovable, and you're told you're going to achieve, then you will become these things and you will develop a strong, resilient mental resource that you will carry for the rest of your life. And the rates of mental disorder, or indeed just unwell-being and unhappiness, are low amongst people with positive attachment relationships. Very strong effect size here. If you are unlucky enough to grow up in a relationship where you are told, I don't love you, Dad doesn't love you either, you're useless, you're fat, you're stupid, we didn't want you, we wanted a girl. That picture you just painted is rubbish. No one's ever gonna love you. You develop a very disordered sense of self with very negative narratives about self. I am useless, I am worthless, I am, I am, uh, I'm, I'm, I'm never gonna achieve. And negative narratives of the world. People are dangerous, the world is risky. 
I'm a, I'm, I'm, I must get the boot in first. If someone praises me or compliments me, they don't mean it. And this is a very disordered picture of self and also community. And what we have going on in psychedelics, I see, is not just about reciprocity towards non-Western users of psychedelics, but again, I want to bring the spotlight onto the general public in mental health care systems in the West and in the UK. This beautiful place with these beautiful people, we are a tiny bubble. Most people out there drive white vans, watch X Factor, watch Love Island, drink lager, smoke fags, wear tracksuits, <laughs> shave their heads, go to the pub. And these are all, this is what most people are doing. Or their little silver old, silver haired old ladies, or their kids in playgrounds. This beautiful place is a microcosm bubble. And when we talk about reciprocity, what I want to do is see accessibility for that wider group. So my patients, my shaven-headed, tattooed, tracksuit-wearing, fag-smoking, lager-drinking patients, by God, do they need psychedelics, <laughs> okay? These are, these are broken, damaged, traumatized people who've not had that positive attachment relationship. And then it manifests in whatever mental illness, and I absolutely agree with everyone on the panel that the diagnostic categories are all junk. Um, it doesn't really matter. That early trauma is going to become something, whether it's an eating disorder or PTSD or an addiction. It doesn't really matter what the end phenotype is. It's going to become something. And we need to connect with those people by using psychedelics. And I think that what this means in terms of reciprocity is us meeting our clients where they are, not expecting them to be where, they, where we are. And this comes back to the issue of the indigenous uses as well. Why on earth, when we do psychedelic research studies, is there always a Buddha and Jostics <laughs> and Indian batiks hanging on the walls? Why not a picture of Manchester United, a picture of Beyonce? If these are our patients' power objects, then we should be meeting them where they are, not expecting them to... Um, turn themselves into this hippie genre subculture. <laughs> they, the first thing I do when I sit down with a patient is I say, I work for you. You are my boss. I don't know what's wrong with you. You do. You know, you've always known what's wrong with you. And I'm going to help you. And I'm going to feel very privileged to sit alongside you on your life's journey. And you're going to teach me about yourself, about what you need to do to get better. And that's reciprocity. Mm. Thank you, Ben, and thank you for bringing in the, the patient uh, carer reciprocity because that's an a often misunderstood one, isn't it? So now, panel, we're going to open up where you're allowed to interrupt each other and you're allowed to contradict each other if you think it's necessary. Um, there's a few things that I would love to pick up on. Feel free to bring up anything you think is relevant to this conversation before we get on to the last one on the list, of course, which is planetary healing, which is probably the big one, isn't it? And I want to start by speaking to uh, Andrea about something that she mentioned earlier about this, this question that a lot of science struggles to include subjective states of being. And I think they would mention the fact that we really, as scientific researchers, it's really important that we learn how to include that and in what way to do that properly. So Andrea, do you think there's a problem so far with the way psychedelics are being promoted in the medical context? Do you think there's something extra we need to include here to, to really make the most of the subjective experience that, as, as David mentioned, really has a massive healing effect? <laughs> <laughs> So I'm not a psychotherapist or a scientist. <laughs> I think I love science. I love the brain scans. You know, I find the psychedelic science in incredibly interesting. And I think it's really, again, just I, I always want to pull back and pull it out more broadly. So if I could actually flip the question to something I think is, how do we also see indigenous knowledges as their own science? Mm -hmm respect that and engage in deep listening. That's, uh, I'm seeing my friend Felipe in the back and we talk about this and, and the words deep listening a lot. And I think that's a bit what's happening here today. And it's about how do we um, look at science? How do we look at indigenous ways of knowing and also realize that 
science around psychedelics is getting more and more attention because we have a policy quagmire, which is called criminalization and the inability to use these within the context of countries because they're not acknowledged as they are in Gabon or in Peru as cultural treasures. Mm. And so I guess I would want to actually turn to, yes, the science is amazing. The medicalization is amazing. The, the, our ability to bring it out more broadly to different kinds of practices and true also recognition of indigenous ways of knowing is to say, why are, why are we so focused on the science? And yes, it's because it, we, we're, we want to understand how these work, but it's also because we're stuck in a context where we're trying to prove to somebody that these work. I know that psychedelics work. Anyone else here? Do we want to have science to know how to actually support people so that they can be better and better healing tools within contexts and communities? Yes. Yeah, we, we run a program at ICRS called the Ayahuasca Defense Fund. And what we see is more and more people getting criminalized for, for working with medicines and moving them around the world. So my, I think one of the biggest challenges with biocultural sustainability of these medicines is the policy context. I think the biggest issue also for how do we get access to more people is the policy context. So we're trying to make a case. I think even the whole issue around creating pharmaceuticals, we're playing with an, an old game for something that has so much more potential because we have a policy context where we have governments who are not recognizing or there's there's the ways in are really difficult to actually operate as we'd like to, where we can actually respect all these forms of knowledge. We've created this split away from indigenous knowledge that I don't think is the intention of the scientists. I think it's the system and the game of what is considered knowledge. And so, yeah, just bringing it back to that. And I think another point, if I could just slip it in here, is I feel like these are really, really big concepts. We're throwing around things around policy, science, and also thinking about words like decolonization. And, and I do feel like every single one of us within this community has roles to play, and, and they're different for each of us. But I get really worried that we're going to get really stuck. It's like I'm supposed to decolonize everything. Um, yeah, you know, it's like looking at our own places of influence, but where the medicine that we're taking is coming from, who's benefiting from that, what does being um, knowledgeable about those things. And so looking at your own sphere of influence, um, I'm also doing some assessment work for a new fund that's being created that's called the Indigenous Medicine Conservation Fund by Dr. Bronner's and River Sticks. They're out of the US. That's going to create a 20 to $40 million fund to fund directly to indigenous people who are carriers of these medicines around sustainability. And so there's different places where we can support and create mechanisms to also find our own, um, our own resilience and our ability to act on some of these these really big issues. So mm. that was I went a lot of places there in a very feminine way, and so <laughs> well, that's thanks great. for the opportunity. That's great because it's going to just push us off in whichever direction we want to go. Ben, David, anything to respond to there? Yeah, I think um, for me the really important thing is getting this over the line and getting these medicines approved because it's all a moot point whilst they remain illegal. And we can, st oh, we, so we still take them even though they're illegal. We have a lot of fun with them. We have a lot of positive healing with them. And there's a superb wealth of underground illegal psychedelic psychotherapy. And there has been for thousands of years, but certainly within the last 40 years in a much more structured way. And there's an enormous wealth there. But they are still illegal. And we need to get them over the line and make them legal. And that requires some really boring stuff. <laughs> it's not, it, it's psychopharmacology, drug development is boring. And what's so interesting about this whole concept, if, if, we, if I just work with lithium or lanzapine or something, no one would come to any talks. It's just such boring, dry drug development. But these drugs have a, a coincidental linkage with culture as well. And we all know about MDMA and ketamine and LSD and psilocybin and DMT because they're kind of drugs of... Um, cultural funness and they bring together people in communities and they're very cohesive but from a psychopharmacological point of view and from a drug development point of view that's bloody irritating right that they have this history because it means there is a huge spotlight of interest and political controversy where actually these are just drugs 
Now, there are lots of other things as well, but in the eyes of FDA and EMA and MHOA, they are just drugs. Um, the, um, the MHOA do not see psilocybin as any different from paracetamol or penicillin, and nor should they in many ways. Their job is to say, has this drug been through the correct testing levels? Has it gone through preclinical study, studies, animal studies, phase one, phase two, phase three? Has it shown safety and efficacy on enough number of people and if it does, you will get it approved and it will be move from an experimental research chemical to a medicine. And that requires a lot of very boring things. And that requires a language that makes that happen. Or it just simply won't happen. And we talk about, sometimes there's criticisms of the medical model taking our sacred molecules away. Well, firstly, they're not your sacred molecules, whoever you are. They are molecules. They don't belong to anyone. But what we do want to see is have them accessible. And I think sometimes the criticism of medicalization and corporatization is that it will become more, more exclusive. People worry that by being medicalized, these compounds will become more exclusive. I see the exact opposite. I see the current situation, which is incredibly exclusive. Well, firstly, you have to be prepared to break the law, which most people aren't. Secondly, you, um, these, these drugs tend to be used much more in white, trustafarian Western cultures with predominantly white men. Um, and it's very exclusive, the current system. If you've got enough money to fly off to Peru or go to Totnes and take mushrooms in a year, but most people don't. So it's the current situation that's incredibly exclusive. By medicalizing them and incre increasing accessibility to all, we are widening and broadening the inclusivity of these drugs. So I don't see that this is going to result in a destruction of psychedelic culture. Look at this beautiful psychedelic culture we have. It has absolutely thrived in the last 15 years since the psychedelic renaissance. Great book, by the way. Um, so we've seen a thriving. It's not either or, it's both and. Both can exist together. There will always be festivals, there will always be whales, there will always be little pointed mushrooms to be picked, there will always be bonfires on the beach, there will always be raves, there will always be ecstasy, there will always be festivals and conferences and books and hippies and recreational use. That, will, that is not going anywhere, but what we'll also have is you being to a normal everyday person to go into your GP and be prescribed one of these medicines by a licensed practitioner in a legal structured way mm. and that is fantastic both things will happen together and flourish yeah <laughs> david david you mentioned the qualitative element uh, of a lot of this research that often gets sidelines in getting it across the line as mm. ben so rightly puts it how important is qualitative research because obviously our experience our peak experiences our exceptional human experiences as they would call them great book as well great book <laughs> um, <laughs> if you <laughs> how important are they for getting them across the line or could it be the opposite that actually qualitative research and all of the psychedelic shall we say baggage may actually confuse the medical establishment what do you think David? I, I think the medical establishment probably are a bit confused and confused by psychedelics but um <clears throat> I don't think it prevents them from maybe utilising them. And obviously we've seen this massive kind of wealth of interest and a bit of a gold rush actually uh, for pharmaceutical startups and developing these as medicines. But, you know, I think we can't just focus on the, on the biomedical aspects of it, not even just qualitatively, but uh, the, the subjective, subjective experiences is really vital, I think. And you can look at that in a quantitative way as well, as, as they have done at Hopkins. And we can measure your mystical experience, you know. <laughs> There's nothing more gratifying than asking somebody in a, <clears throat> the, the initial throes of a DMT experience on a scale of one to 10, how intense is this experience right now? <laughs> as I have done. And, you know, they either just laugh, say nothing, or occasionally go, 11. <laughs> uh, but, you know, we can quantify these things as well. Uh, obviously, the qualitative stuff is, is a bit more generous. Uh, so, but, it, of course, we can't get away from the subjective experience. We are, we are kind of human beings with, with consciousness. These are, even just looking on the mental health side of things, these are experiences of consciousness. And I think 
personally for me, I'm a psychologist and I'm, I'm interested in the aspects of consciousness, which, which kind of are foregrounded with psychedelics. And that, for me, is the most exciting stuff. I'm not really that excited by the, the, the medical applications, particularly I'm interested in changing our entire worldview, right? Like the, the way we kind of consider reality is all a bit screwed up in the West, essentially. And, and I think there's a lot we can, we can learn by just really inspecting that, flipping it on its head. And I think psychedelics are really good at doing that, making us question our, our own perspectives and our own realities and our own beliefs. And when we do that, we realise they are just our own perceptions and beliefs and cultural conditioning and all the rest of it. And I think we, I think we need to kind of think bigger. You know, we just, I mean, I think, I think this is a Trojan horse, of course, and, and it's going to be fantastic that we can get all these millions of people with depression some decent treatment finally but it's it's much bigger than that and it goes beyond just just like mental health right and it's about our entire sanity as a species and this ties in with the ideas of sustainability as well which we just touched upon it's like you know what's going on in, on the planet ecologically speaking and what's our role in that and what role does do psychedelics have in that and it's it's not just about okay making you do more recycling it's it's about just changing our whole concept of who we are where we are and where we fit into nature and cosmos and everything and i think psychedelics are the kind of well one of the fastest tools for bringing that change bringing that kind of self-awareness and and asking those kind of questions so for me it goes much 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 bigger than that it's like yeah. let's take it all the way to what is the nature of reality and who are we and and what the fuck are we doing on the planet <laughs> <laughs> Gabriel, Gabriel, obviously many, many elders have spoken about exactly the, what David's mentioning. We've got maybe a sick society. Uh, our Western culture is maybe a little bit sick. What do you think this reciprocal circle we're discussing can bring to the sort of, uh, it's obviously a massive blanket term, but, but a, a sick world? Hmm. Again, I think it's about questioning ourselves. Um, questioning privilege. Um, I, I know that the word privilege is a, an uncomfortable term in these times. Sometimes when I bring it up, it's like, oh no, you're going to talk about privilege also in the psychedelic process? No, <laughs> that belongs to gender studies. <laughs> but yes, we need to talk about privilege. Um, we need to talk about how psychedelics are basically expanded in a bubble of white privileged people mm. and how most of the people needing psychedelics are actually not non-white. I mean, my work for MAPS has been trying to get MDMA therapy in Europe um, for refugees and migrants who 75% of them suffer PTSD. And how to do it, it has shown to be incredibly difficult. Not because they don't want to, or because the governments don't want to, but because we don't have the societal structures to do it. We don't, we don't fight for refugees and migrants in our daily lives, the same as we don't fight for indigenous populations in our daily lives. My perspective is that psychedelics should become more of a revolutionary tool in which we actually fight more for engaging the privilege that we have and work with it for accessibility. You mentioned accessibility. Accessibility, I think, is the key word in all this situation. Because if people can't access psychedelics, we're just going to make psychedelics into a privileged tool a uh, psychological uh, paradigm of uh, white privileged people who are, yeah, having peak experiences and experience so much beauty while the world is burning. And what's, where, where is that going to get us? Not, not very far away. So from my perspective, I think we need to become much more of activists ourselves. And I think one, one th well, like when I started working uh, for drug policy, um, Psychedelics were far away, you know, <laughs> because I, f first of all, like the, the, how I arrived to psychedelics was through drug policy. 
And drug policy is very ignored in the psychedelic world. Everybody's talking about like medicalization. Yes, okay, medicalization is a way of kind of taking psychedelics through the gap and ignoring drug policy and being like, okay, psychedelics are now legal, the other ones are not, but <laughs> it's fine. And we should actually be fighting also for the regulation of cocaine, for the regulation of opium, <laughs> because these substances are also cultural and they have a very important cultural significance. And if we don't pay attention to coca leaf, to opium, <laughs> then we're actually not paying attention at all. <laughs> we're just kind of... Uh, how do you say that, like, directionally focused, uh, conveniently focused to our own paradigm of, yes, okay, psychedelics are amazing, they are groundbreaking experiences, but what about what everybody needs in terms of, you know, like, regulation of substances, understanding of what decolonization means? I think, I mean, I, I don't know if I'm answering the question, but I think in this way, the way of actually reciprocate and fight in every side that we can is to become much more of political activists for drug policy, for accessibility, for understanding how to get psychedelics into vulnerable populations, women who were victim of sexual abuse, migrants and refugees, people victim of racial trauma. Recently there was this um, Racial trauma, uh, PTSD trials with uh, for uh, with MDMA by maps, and there were a lot of problems because many of the people participating they were not sensitized enough. It was a very difficult process for many people, and then many many people were realizing, oh, actually we're not very ready for this which actually was such a metaphor of what's happening in the psychedelic world that we are wanting to understand already the nature of reality <laughs> when we don't even know how people in Syria or in Afghanistan are, are living and what their needs are in terms of mental health. <laughs> so yeah, maybe let's step down a little bit from our uh, qualitative research of the nature of reality and maybe let's look a little bit of, uh, to our reality and fight a little bit more for, for, for it, mm. and for them. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you and as so often, um, shamanism has been present from the beginning in all uh, First Peoples, both white and non-white. And so for me, the shamanism is maybe sort of the elephant in the room, but we really, if we make friends with this elephant, perhaps could be more useful. Andre, tell us, how, how are we supposed to bring shamanism constructively into this discussion? So I'm also not an expert on shamanism. <laughs> it's a word I actually don't use. I think I'm going to come in a different way yeah, again. Yeah. <laughs> what I think is so interesting about these medicines that are moving around the world and these practices which I would call relationships. We're all be getting into relationship with different um, molecules, different plants and one of the most interesting things that I've watched in myself and other communities is that the entry point may be for some, for example, ayahuasca. I think of a really incredible elder from Catalonia named Yaya Pilar and you know, she came in as a daimista, entered through ayahuasca, and her community now is recovering and developing relationships with medicinal plants and land spirits where they're from. And this is one of the things that I think is really interesting about the waking up that is enabled by these practices. We could call them shamanic, maybe just earth-based practices or practices that bring us into relationship with our natural environment and with other plants. So I, what I think is actually just really fascinating is how we can all get reacquainted with um, practices or relationships with plants, the natural world and traditions from where we're actually from. And, and I do think that's been one of the gifts of some of these medicines from other places that travel around the world to bring us back to our own, our own history and our own relationship to where we're from. And, I just I think it's a gift and it's incredibly fascinating and it's something that I you know think it's interesting to continue to explore and talk about and we have some incredible herbalists on site here who are doing this that and and reconnecting to the place where we're from and so let's yeah let's follow that thread a little bit. Mm. 
Ashley, you've, as you said, got feet in both sides. A little clap. <laughs> You've obviously got feet in firmly planted on both sides of this. Do you think shamanism has a role to play in the, in the way we roll this out in the West? Um, I might do what Andrea did and, and come at this another way. Brilliant. Brilliant. <laughs> That's okay. Please. Um, I suppose because where I'm, where I'm sitting is... I mean, the answer, I mean, a simple straight up answer is yes, because as I said, like, you know, I'm a co-founded an organization which is about thinking about all of these kind of this shadow side of the psychedelic experience, including, you know, how we're connected to those indigenous roots and um, and how we have a conversation, a real deep listening conversation. Um, so that's a very simple answer. I guess where I'm sat is also in this um, real uh, mainstream mental health in the UK position and um, the things that Ben refers to as boring I find them absolutely fascinating <laughs> you know these um, processes that we're going to go through in mainstreaming of, of, of talking to the government and of uh, talking to pharma and we're going to be wrangling and we're going to be deep in that process and it's this you know it's a mad process right there's a lot going to gonna go on there and, and, and maybe for some people it's really boring but I, I'm fascinated by it and I think um, something that I always am, I'm thinking about at the moment is um, speed. Speed is a narrative that we bring in a lot around this. Like we've got to get them over the line. We've got to go fast. And I think you're right, Ben. We, you know, the people are really suffering, and we really do need to move this. But I also think, at what cost do we go fast? You know, like I know in my own life, whenever I everything, n nothing comes for free, right? So if I if I speed ahead on something and I do it, I can very often get to the other side and be like, oh my god, I forgot to do that. And I think that, you know, what's at stake here is enormous. So I think that actually how we navigate this process, how we hold culture and pharma and the mainstreaming process and ethics and all of this actually is really, really important. And I think we need to do it well, because otherwise we could get to the other side, look back and think, oh, damn it, we really missed an opportunity there. So, Nick, so much to respond to. It's just like, wow, we've got the whole picture. Anything you'd like to add before we um, go to close? Yeah, the just comments? just um, reiterating what, what what Ashley said. I think we really we only have one shot at this. We really do. And, and as I said, it is arguably the most important industry that, that humanity will ever build. And and unless we forget also that you know in in modern times, I don't think there's been an industry that's that's drawn upon such a disparate number of of subsectors as well. You've got so many different stakeholders ranging from drug discovery to drug development to real estate funds for clinics to um, CPG companies to wellness to telemedicine to health tech. Everyone's trying to figure this out. And the amount of money that's pouring into this space is is ridiculous. I mean, it's it's and there's a lot of hot air, but it's terrifying at the speed of at, at which this train is moving. And I think you know, as, as Ashley Riley said, we have to pump the brakes a bit because it's, we only get one shot. Um, there are a lot of different stakeholders that, that have a voice and need to be heard. Um, but the, the old paradigm of IP driven pharma is, is not the way it should, should be. I mean, I think that's, that's exactly the model that we're trying to move away from. And yes, we understand that we need the distribution infrastructure that pharma provides, but at the same time, we need to figure out a way to to build us in the right way that, that yes, serves humanity in, a, in an accessible way, but also an affordable way. I mean, we, we talk about access, but, but affordability is something that we know that big pharma are gonna have to make up for their losses for you know, someone having a, a peak experience in psilocybin and coming off the antidepressants. And you know, that big pharma are gonna lose out on 25 years of antidepressant prescriptions for that person. You know, we, we have to figure out a way to move away from that old paradigm. And that might be you know, policy work where you know, reciprocity is built into the actual, you know, legal structure of, of some of these companies where there's a royalty stream. You know, if, if big pharma want to have their cake and eat it, perhaps 2% of top line revenue goes towards supporting indigenous ecosystem and cultural preservation, something like that. But that, that is the opportunity that we have collectively to, to try and figure this out. And it's moving way too fast for, for my liking and, and I think for some of us here as well. But um, stronger together, we'll figure it out. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm.
So guys, I think before we move over to the audience, because I'm sure they have as many questions as I do, um, we'll just do a one along the line, just closing comments, anything that's come up, particularly in response to your colleagues today, because there's so much to think about just here. Ashley. Well, my whole um, approach here is to do it together because it's really hard. It's really, really difficult. What we're trying to do is is not simple and it's not easy. And um, and I think it's I, I think it's possible for us to hold and contain all of the differences that we have and the different viewpoints and perspectives that we have. And I think actually it would be incredibly beautiful to be able to do that. And and I also, you know, I'm really not naive. I don't think that's going to be simple. But it is what I I I really want to to kind of hold up as, as a possibility and, and what I'm going to really strive to do. And I really, really appreciate and respect all of the opinions and um, yeah, offerings from my colleagues here. Thank you. What's coming up for me is that this is the work. You know, I think a lot of the issues that we're grappling with in, in this realm of what we call psychedelics are mirrored from larger society. And I think when things go a, wee, a little bit weird that way, like I think I get really disheartened because I, I really believe that these medicines, these plants, these sacred relationships are showing us a different way. And I really hope that we can listen. And so... Let's take it on. It is work. It's going to be a process and, and having everyone involved and really looking to how to be in dialogue and deep listening with each others with each other and especially people who don't traditionally get to sit up here, just really acknowledging also and being grateful for the privilege of um, getting to touch this microphone so many times today. <laughs> <laughs> um, I think in short... Um, as I mentioned, I think, yeah, I suppose building off what, what Ashley said, just, just stronger together. This is a lot of tension in the industry right now, um, and we need to figure it out together. I think, you know, we all need to work on ourselves. I think, you know, learning, growing, ar arriving, never arriving is one of our, our kind of core principles. I think we need to be guided by, we need to preserve timeless wisdom. Um, and uh, and we, we're going to get there. But um, I'm just honored to be here on stage with all you lot and... We're all, we're all doing our bit, and I look forward to continuing the dialogue. Well, as um, as, a may, uh, as the only non-Western people <laughs> sitting in this panel, I I would like to say something that is very important for me. Um, I think it's very important for us. Um, in political activism, there is this term that is known as the allies. An ally, you know, like in pr when, when someone has a privileged situation, is not about coming and be like, hey, I'm going to help you. It's actually about becoming an ally to underprivileged populations. So we are the privileged populations. Me too, because I'm the white Mexican. In, and in Mexico, being white means uh, being pretty privileged. So we need to see to all the people that need our help in the psychedelic world and to understand what they need. And let's do this together. We can do this. We have the privilege of being white, of having money, of having resources, of having love, of having community. We can do this together. And I'm not, I don't mean only towards uh, indigenous populations, which is, of course, very important. Shamans, communities, they are incredibly important and we must support them and be with them and ask them what they need. But also, drug policy, uh, recreational settings, people who, take who want to keep taking psychedelics for recreational use, are they going to be represented in the psychedelic renaissance? Or is, only, or, or is medicalization be actually like taking them off the picture? Because maybe law enforcement it, is going to have even more resources to fight recreational settings. Can we fight for them too? Can we fight for uh, migrants and refugees who need a new access to mental health? Like, let's use the privilege that we have and let's, let's become allies of everyone who is in search of accessibility of the psychedelic experience and open this range of accessibility. Yes. <laughs> Um, 
I don't really have too much to say other than I've really enjoyed being on this panel. It's been a, a great privilege, actually. Yeah, of course. And um, I've learned a lot and it's, it's great to just listen, I think. I want mm. to echo that. Um, I always talk too much. Uh, <laughs> and, and just ask the question. I mean, the question like framing this whole festival is like, how do we be the medicine? And I think that's a great thing. You know, how do we each in our lives move forward and move towards a, a greater wholeness on every level? So just that, listening and asking questions. I'll shut up now. Thank you. <laughs> Yeah, in, in terms of closing remarks, firstly, thank you so much. Yes, uh, this is, you're quite right. This is what we do. We get together and we do this. <laughs> this is how it works. I think my, I, I want to finish with a point of optimism, and I'm going to sound like a hippie here, which is not too bad, because um, <laughs> I'm usually sort of like the, the sciencey guy. But my, my closing remarks are trust the medicine, because I believe that the medicine will take us in the direction that we need to go in. It just works. If you take a high-dose LSD um, and you walk around a supermarket, you will be in stitches as you come to the realisation that 98% of the stuff on the shelves is superfluous. You, have, you start challenging ecological problems right away. You take a high-dose DMT. You spontaneously question the nature of reality and existence and yourself in it. You can't not. You take MDMA in a clinical setting. You come away with greater levels of empathy and love and wanting to connect with others and care for your children and your family. The medicine knows where to go. It will take us in the right direction. Trust the medicine. That's what I would say. So thank you so much to our amazing panel for such a, a, a diverse and complete look at this very, very complex issue and so much optimism, I think, is the big takeaway. We really are at a wonderful turning point. And thank you very much for all of the audience of Chasing Consciousness who are going to be listening to this talk remotely. So just make a big cheer for my audience, please. Yeah. Yeah.